We have talked about the birth of a star, we have talked about planet formation, so it's only logical that the next step is to talk about the violent event that is the death of a star. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the Science of Elite with Down to Earth Astronomy. So, the death of a star. Let's start by doing a quick recap of what we recall from last time when we talked about star formation. Now, we left the stars um, right at the beginning of the main phase, and we're actually going to skip through the majority of the star's life because it's fairly uneventful. And the part we're going to skip past is what's called the main phase or the main sequence. And in this part of the star's life, there are, as you might recall if you've seen the past video, three main forces at work that keeps this star stable or in what's called hydrostatic equilibrium. We have the gravity pulling the star inwards, and we have the gas pressure or plasma pressure, but we have a gas pressure that's pushing outwards. And we also have the radiation pressure coming from the core of the star, um, which is basically the light actually pushing on the material. It, it, it can seem a little counterintuitive, but light have impulse. And since light have impulse, it can move stuff. Um, whole concept about solar sails and all that stuff. So. Um, so that's a thing, but that's a, um, a player that will play a major role in the in the end of the star's life cycle. Now, this of course, um, this radiation pressure that's been uh, been keeping the, the star stable, um, that thing of course arises from the hydrogen fusion process that takes place in the core of the star. So it's important to remember that only the the, um, the hydrogen at the core of the star is um, is actually being burned. All the outer layers, um, which there are different layers, but for now we're just going to assume it's the core and everything else. All that is not being burned. It's not hot enough that the fusion process can start. But eventually, depending on the size of the star, eventually the star is going to run out of fuel. There's going to be no more hydrogen left. It can't make that hydrogen uh, burn process. So it burned hydrogen into helium. So it will all be converted into helium. At this point, the um, radiation pressure, of course, begins to decrease and eventually will stop. Now, this will start a inside-out collapse of the star, um, starting from the core, and the core will begin to contract. And if you know about thermal dynamics, you will know that uh, if you compress a gas, it heats up, and if you expand a gas, it cools down. Um, you probably already know this intuitively, but you never probably have thought about it. If you take a can of compressed air and you blow out air from it, you will feel it's cold. And that's because you have a gas under a lot of pressure and you put it outside the can where it expands and cools off. Um, so the same thing happens here with the core. The core of the star begins to collapse. Pressured in, now that we have the uh, the, um, the radiation pressure is gone, there's nothing, the hydrostatic equilibrium has been, um, it's no longer an equilibrium. So it begins to collapse. As it collapses, the heat increases. As the heat increases, we suddenly get to a point, um, at least for a certain type of star, where we can begin to go from a hydrogen burning process to a helium burning process. So all that hydrogen has been converted into helium, and we now have a very helium rich core. Suddenly we get hot enough that helium can begin to burn. Now, this is a lot more energetic process. And Furthermore, of course, now since the whole center of the star has heated up, that means that there's now a shell around the core where it's suddenly now hot enough that um, the hydrogen can begin to burn. So we get this shell, this onion structure where you have something burning at the core and then you have a shell around it with, um, with some other things burning. So now we actually have double up on the radiation pressure. Now, this means that suddenly the radiation pressure is going to begin to um, to reverse the process of the inside-out collapse. And it's actually going to begin to expand the outer layers. And we recall that when a gas expands, it cools down. So as the outer layer of the star begins to expand while it is in this uh, last phase, um, it also begins to cool down. The outer layer of the star cools down while the inner core is hotter. It's a little confusing here, but... but Stay with me. Cause hot, outer layer begins to cool down, which is why the um, the star begins to go more red uh, at the end of its life cycle. You also know this intuitively. If you take a bar of any metal and begin to heat it up, 
once you get up to around 5,000 uh, Kelvin, 5,000 degrees Celsius, don't know what that's in Fahrenheit, uh, Google it, um, then you will begin to see it glow um, white hot. And as it begins to cool off, it goes from white and slowly down to, um, to red. And theoretically, you could keep heating it up even more and it will actually go blue. Um, which is also why blue stars, or the big stars, which are very hot, they're also blue. Um, so color and temperature are, um, are, kind of, um, are kind of interrelated here. So the outer layer begins to cool off, the star goes, um, um, goes colder. And this is why that this part of the star's life is called the red giant phase, because the star swells up, becomes very, very big, and it becomes very red. And if you remember, we talked about, um, when I talked about the impossible star, and um, we talked about the whole HR diagram and how stars live, and I went through that in quite a bit of detail, so I'm not going to do that now. But we can see here that we have the main branch going across here, and then we have these, um, what's called the red giant branch, red giant face, uh, it's depend th th these branches that goes out here. Um, and this is where the star begins to move out of, uh, of those branches here. And... Again, this process, that's what's happening in the in the uh, in the core. It's much quicker because the 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 helium burning is a lot more. Uh, it burns up the material a lot quicker, so it's not going to last as long as the main phase. But then, the, again, depending on the size of the star, it could go through this cycle many many times, where it would run out of helium, and then it would begin to contract the, and then they would suddenly get even hotter, and we could start begin burning hotter materials that will produce heavier elements, and then we get both a helium and a hydrogen burning shell around it, and then you get this onion structure that I that I talked about. Now, what happens here at this very large uh, part of the star's life depends largely on its mass. For most stars, for the last uh, vast majority of stars, stars like our sun. What will happen is eventually the, um, there's just not enough mass in the star that it can get on to the next level in this uh, constantly heavier, heavier element, and it will stop. It cannot get hot enough to actually begin to produce a new, um, uh, a new fusion um, uh, phase. And that means that the outer layer will slowly be expelled away from the star. It will blow out to a big uh, planetary nebula, and we will be left with only the core sitting there being very hot and um, and just um, radiating its heat out into space. And that's how you build, uh, how you create a white dwarf. So a white dwarf is actually just a remnant of a star, um, the core of a star and the, that's left over after the outer layers have been expelled um, as the star ran out of fuel and just sitting there ending its life pretty much. Now, if the star is big enough, what will happen at the very large moments of the star's life is that you'll begin to get an effect called neutralization of the core. And that's something that happens um, because the plasma, and here you have to remember that a plasma is a, um, compared to a gas, a gas is gas atoms. So you have a nucleus with atom or electrons floating around it, and they are all free flying uh, amongst each other. That's a gas. A plasma, on the other hand, is a gas that's been heating up so hot that all the electrons have been stripped off uh, the nucleus. So you have free-floating nucleus and you have free-floating electrons floating in a big mess. As the core here begins to get uh, denser and denser and denser, collapses more and more and more in on itself, and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, um, eventually you begin to, to push things so close together that you actually will have electrons and protons, so the negatively and the positively charged particles, um, but they get pushed in so close that they can actually overcome that barrier. And they will then fuse together into a neutron and a lot of other uh, fancy particles that we will not worry about today. Um, but you will get this neutralization of the core and the all the, the charged particles, the charge will begin to disappear and the core will, will gradually become more and more neutral. So when this thing had happened and the outer layers is expelled, what it's now left with is a neutron star. And that's why it's called a neutron star, because it mostly consists of neutrons, because all the other elements have all the charge have pretty much been, um, been removed. Um, but again, we still have the largest of the stars, the very big ones. These guys, they don't just like go out into to nothing here. Now, what happens here is, again, we keep this collapse, and this just goes completely run amok. 
And at some point, it's just not possible to collapse the core even more. The exact physics at this point is a little fuzzy around the edges. We are kind of getting pretty close to, to I mean, the, we have so violent forces and we don't have a good enough understanding of what happens when you compress things that much, I think. So it's a little fuzzy exactly what happens here. But as I, I kind of imagine it as at some point there is just not enough room between all the, the, the subatomic particles and the hole just kind of goes like gunk, and it stops very suddenly. That sudden stop sends out a shock wave through the outer layers of the star, expelling them at very great velocities. And we have ourselves a supernova. Now, if the star is big enough to produce a supernova, there's a good chance that the core has collapsed within its own, what's called a Schwarzschild radius, or what's more popularly referred to as the event horizon, and you have yourself a black hole. So as you can see, it depends a lot on the size of the star, exactly what happens at the end and what you get. If you get a white dwarf, do you get a neutron star, do you get a black hole? And there are other ways that stars dies in more complicated ways. There's a specific type of supernovae called a type 1a supernova, um, which is formed when you have a uh, we have two uh, binary stars, you have two stars that are binary, orbiting around each other, and one is sucking up material off the other star. So they're orbiting so close that it's scooping up material from the other star. Big star is fuel scooping the smaller one. And it will, or the heavy star is fuel scooping the lighter one. And at some point, the, um, the star will then reach a, a certain uh, mass, a critical mass, at which point it will go supernova. And the reason why specifically these supernovae are so in interesting because it always happens at the exact same mass. And that means that the events are almost always extremely identical. And for uh, in astrophysics to have two events where you know that the events were... Um, were identical, but they happened in different places at different times. That is extremely interesting. That is what we in astronomy call a standard candle. It is a light source that have that we know exactly what the light emitting from it is. And we can then use that to determine lots of stuff like distance um, and what kind of when the light passes through gas clouds on the way to us, what kind of gas clouds are there and what are they made up of, how big are they, how dense are they. We can tell a lot not only about the event themselves, but of everything else along that line of sight. So when these events happen, it's often to, um, to very great interest to, uh, to astronomers. And I actually uh, worked together with one when I was uh, studying for my master thesis, and she was writing a, um, a piece of software that was supposed to be distributed out on, uh, on most telescopes, at least all the part of that network, um, across the globe. And if one of them decided, uh, detected a, a supernova explosion, some, many of them would just sit and scan the night sky looking for, for a supernova, then it would automatically send out a, um, a message to all the other telescopes, pointing them towards that, um, that light source, that, that uh, event, because these events are so rare that when it happens, we want as much data as we can. So basically, the telescope will just have a, a common like a network, and whenever one of them detected an event like this, all of them would just completely clear the schedule and say, I don't care if you book time, we're looking at that, and we're looking at that for the next couple of weeks until that event is over, because that's often the time scale you can see a, a supernova explosion that's a week, two weeks. Anyway, I, um, I hoped that you learned something today, and uh, I'm definitely planning to do a lot more of these sciencey videos and if you want to have more of those remember to go down and uh, and hit the subscribe button uh, below also please do consider to support the channel on patreon it would mean a lot to me so thanks a lot for watching i hope you enjoyed it and until next time i'll see you guys in space